It's amazing in this time of instant news and social media that we see the results of a major investment before we hear the details. I awarded Gridserve my gold star last month in my pricing guide, a link down below, for their huge expansion of charges throughout the country. Now I have found out that they've just raised a half billion pound debt, or a fancy way of saying loan, making it by far the largest for any charger network provider ever, and the first of its kind in the UK. It's being used to fund over 3,000 rapid and ultra-rapid chargers at over 500 hubs and sites across the UK. The loan is backed by a massive group of big international names like Lloyds Bank, Santander Bank, Arup, PwC, Aon, to name just a few. This is an absolutely massive step, with all the major players, well, apart from the oil giants, supporting it. Now, for those who think ICE cars will survive or that EVs are doomed, this suggests very much otherwise. Now, having opened the floodgates, what's next? Well, watch this space. The lone figure, other than the oil giants not happy about this, is our very own Mr Green, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. I was right, he did approve the selling of over 100 new oil and gas exploration licences in the North Sea. Just what the oil giants needed. And, of course, he'll continue to pay up front for any exploration they think about doing. Has anyone looked into where Sunak gets his political donations from? Well, just asking. Well, all this is on top of the Uxbridge by-election, surprise, surprise, with a whisker-slim margin of less than 500 votes, he scraped a victory. And, of course, helping his oil buddies, he puts that down to the ULEZ, the Ultra Low Emission Zone, expansion ordered by Sadiq Khan. Now, I know there's been a massive storm whipped up about this, but just for a moment, let's take the heat out of it and look at the facts. Well, first, 90% of drivers inside the existing ULEZ do not pay at the moment. Their cars are exempt. The ULEZ charge only applies to older, dirty diesel cars. Second, most importantly, what do both of the players want to achieve? Well, Sadiq Khan wants to remove carcinogenic, toxic, lethal chemicals, gases and particles from the air that come out of the exhaust pipes of the cars in his constituency that his constituents are forced to breathe. Sunak, on the other hand, wants to please the oil giants and gets re-elected. Can anybody out there explain why all the residents got together and joined a huge oil-sponsored movement to not only allow the pollution to continue, but to grow in the future? I am totally baffled. Now, as a follow-up, and it may have already happened by the time this video is launched, Sunak is now looking at whether to cancel the ban on the sale of new fossil fuel cars already enacted into law starting in 2030. Now, let me state two things. First, this is not a ban on fossil fuel cars, as portrayed by the press and the media. There is no ban on the sale of ICE cars for the next seven years anyhow. You can buy as many as you want. In fact, if the ban remains in law, and if the transition to EVs continues at its present exponential rate, then there will be a huge number of internal combustion engine cars being very heavily discounted and sold for the latter few of those seven years. After 2030, you can carry on driving them for as long as you want, filling them up, servicing them, buying and selling them forever. There is no ban on fossil fuel cars, merely the sale of new ones after 2030. Now, since the average life of an internal combustion engine car is 12 to 15 years, that means we can probably drive them around until about 2050 if we want to. Well, second, a massive U-turn in a desperate bid to win re-election and not be ridiculed, ridiculed in history as one of the shortest-lived prime ministers ever, well, apart from Liz Truss, uh, will not stop EVs taking over. Just look at the facts. 
an MG4 EV and several other Chinese ones heading this way this year cost less to buy than a similarly sized As Vauxhall Astra, but cost a tiny fraction of that to fuel. At 8,000 miles a year and say 50 to the gallon, the Astra will use 160 gallons and cost over a thousand pound a year in petrol. Those lucky enough to be able to charge at home will buy 2,000 kilowatt hours of electricity at cheap off-peak rates of well under 12 pence per kilowatt hour, costing about £200 a year. Plus, they have no road tax, no servicing, no congestion charge zones outside of London. Now, if you could charge at home, which would you buy? EV sales will continue. Hertz car rentals now favour EVs. Having bought several thousand Tesla Model 3 and Ys, they found that they're more popular, they attract a higher price, and they spend far less time off the road for servicing, and cost less. Taxis already are rapidly transitioning to EVs. Well, the list is endless. A U-turn will not stop EVs. What it will do is to seal the fate of our green-talking, green-washing Prime Minister. Now, over in the US... Exxon, a simply humongous oil giant, has approached the EV manufacturers to see if it can become a supplier of lithium. With much more lithium, the progress of EVs would accelerate at an even faster rate. Lithium is one of the most common elements on this earth. It is simply everywhere. And where I come from, down in Cornwall, the old tin mines are rich in it. It is highly soluble and the old mines have long been flooded well, for decades. In America, there's enough lithium in one single state to supply the entire world for all its future needs. The stuff is everywhere. The problem is the cost of getting it out of the water or the earth at an affordable price. And surprise, surprise, Tesla's already starting to do this. They have just bought a very sizable plot of land hundreds or thousands of square miles, I can't remember which, and are introducing environmentally friendly, highly efficient extraction techniques never seen before. Now, Exxon might just be trying to corner the market and then find, whoa, surprise, surprise, totally unknown to them. They cannot make a profit, so they'll just hang on to their exclusive licenses. Who knows? Maybe they do see lithium mining more profitable than oil or gas in the long term. Well, Two-Face Grant Shapps made two announcements this week. Like the toad he is, he backs up his boss's decision to sell the oil and gas licences, while at the same time cutting the time in half of the installation upgrading of the national grid to be able to better cope with charging EVs, which he also backs, well, on paper at least, oh, and at least on this week. I, for one, will be glad to get this next election over with. Our government should always be able to be trusted with making decisions for the good of the people or the country, rather than facing an epic defeat or trouncing, instead doing anything that is likely to get them re-elected. Just watch out for all these desperation U-terms over the next few months. These guys and girls represent us, not the other way round. Well, sorry, this is a bit of a political rant, but our future health, security and lifestyle is at stake. And most people seem to be totally blindfolded. Well, oh, I'm all right, Jack. Tesla, meanwhile, ah, oh, yes, I can't include a news update without them. They're planning a lorry, well, what they call a semi, superhighway from Fremont in Northern California right the way down to the south of Texas, a distance approaching 2,000 miles. By installing a series of mega charging stations, each with eight of their brand new 750 kilowatt mega chargers, and also four non Tesla semi chargers. The Tesla semi can charge up in less than half an hour for nearly 300 mile range on one of these. They can cover hundreds of lorries a day. But the overall picture is always one to amaze me. There is always more going on than you first see. Tesla makes EVs and in rapidly increasing numbers. Tesla is also developing full self-driving. Oh, by the way, Neo have announced they've just dropped pre-mapping in favour of vision-based full self-driving research. 
As I previously stated, pre-mapping is just not viable. Anyway, Tesla currently delivers its cars to its distribution collect collection centres by diesel semis pulling trailers, which are terribly polluting and expensive with labour costs. Look ahead a few months or years and Tesla could have self-driving cars that can drive onto a transporter pulled by an electric Tesla semi, which will drive itself to the centres and offload itself. And if the electricity to charge their semis come from PV panels, it will cost them almost nothing. And in an amazing coincidence, that semi superhighway is only a few hundred miles from the just announced and started Gigafactory in Mexico, which will be making from next year onwards the sub £25,000 Model 2 in huge numbers. Just imagine free transport of a million plus cars a year from Mexico to California, its biggest EV market. And talking of ambitious targets, Ford CEO Jim Farley has just released their latest profit and loss figures, or should I say loss? Supporters will claim they have had a massive increase in sales this quarter, but neither Jim nor I agree. Well, first, like all companies, Ford was massively hit by the supply chain shortage and viral shutdowns in 2020 and 2021. Then 2022 was one of a really slow growth due to increasing supply chain shortages. Remember, they couldn't even get the blue badges for the front of the cars. Porsche and BMW, by the way, are still blaming shortages for their really low production figures. May not be true. Anyway, compare 2023 to 2020 or 2021 or 2022 and you get a very distorted figure. But far more importantly, Ford do not sell any cars to customers. In a quaint, seemingly unbreakable tradition, Ford sell to their independent dealers. And all of these have been almost bare of new cars for the whole of the last three years. You could just not get hold of a new car at all for love nor money. That's why the prices last year rocketed and used car prices followed. Remember, your car was worth more than you paid for it. What Ford has been delivering has merely topped up the dealers to levels approaching that found in 2019. But in the meantime, the dealers have got greedy. When prices skyrocketed, they ramped up their prices accordingly. Well, now they have plenty of stock. Hey, they quite like those profit margins. So those artificial high prices are here to stay. Prices today at the dealers are around $3,000 higher than they were in 2019-2020. And they're already finding it harder to sell at these crazy prices. Look at the days of cars in stock. How many of the cars sold to their dealers will actually be sold on to customers? Well, I have my suspicions. Now, on a follow-up, Jim Foley announced that their Model E division, that's the electric car division split off for reasons that will be covered in another video to be released shortly, has been losing a little bit of money. Well, no, hell no, a shed load of money. Each EV they sold lost them about $32,000. I'm speechless. No wonder they've announced that they're scaling back the production of EVs. Their target a few months ago to reach 2 million EVs a year by 2026 has been scrapped. And luckily so. Had they actually followed it, they would just have gone butt bust that much quicker. Now, a new business model could scrap dealers and sell direct to the public, saving many thousands per vehicle. Then they could deliver them with electric lorries, saving more thousands per vehicle. Then they could ditch the old-fashioned just-in-time, buy-it-in-and-buy-it-cheap policy and go back to what made them big over a hundred years ago, when they invented mass car production and they made absolutely all the bits themselves. Well, any odds on them doing this? When well, other EV news, rapid and ultra-rapid chargers now number more than petrol stations in the UK, 
and most new EVs can add 100 to 200 miles in 10 to 15 minutes. It's not ideal, we do need about 10 times as many, but road trips are getting better. Oh, by the way, that figure excludes public roadside fast chargers and destination chargers and home chargers. I know most people simply discount the fact that about 50% of all EV drivers will only ever charge at home. As for me, I show here my own actual figures. Last year, I completed 5,961 kilowatt hours of charging from all sources. My car does three miles per kilowatt hour, so that equates to about 18,000 miles. 70% of that was done at home. That's 12,600 miles, three miles per kilowatt hour. 4,200 kilowatt hours at 12p per kilowatt hour is 504 pound. And 30% was supercharging. That's 5,400 kilowatt hours at three miles per kilowatt hour equals 1,800 at 40 pence per kilowatt hour at 720 pound for a total of 1224 pound for the year the tesla app estimated 1347 fairly similar and that equates to 7 pence per mile driven now had I driven an ICE car at 40 mile per gallon, and don't talk about 50, 60 miles to the gallon, my car is Model S. It's a big, fast car, not a tiny city runaround. And I do most of my mileage on the motorway. I would have bought about 450 gallons at £6.78 per gallon, or £1.49 litre, making £3,051, or 17 pence a mile. I paid less than half of that. An average motorist would cover 8,000 miles, 160 gallons or 1,085 versus an EV charging only at home, 8,000 kilowatt hours at 4 mile per kilowatt hours, 2,000 kilowatt hours equals 12p, uh, at 12p equals 240 pound. Well, sorry to all those who cannot charge at home, but if you expect me to buy petrol or diesel just because you can't charge at home, you will have a very, very long wait. PwC, that's uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, the uh, international accountants, estimate that 72% of owners in the UK, car owners in the UK, can already charge at home. And many more will soon be able to once curbside connections come over, become available. Here's a nifty little device I found that's just been approved by Milton Creek Keynes Council. Well, the EV charging scene is changing at a scary pace. Keep in touch, subscribe so you don't miss out. I'm Dave.